So as we discussed, uh, so from today we'll be starting with Kubernetes. So before going there, uh, let us understand what Docker Swarm is and uh, what are the features that are lacking and why we are going for Kubernetes further. Okay. So uh, in Docker itself, um, like Docker was like originally designed this particular Docker Swarm where you can form your cluster and then you can uh, uh, run or you can scale your applications at any point of time. Okay, so cluster in the sense uh, grouping multiple nodes together under one platform is called as a cluster. Okay, you can manage your cluster. You can manage your nodes from a centralized location and it can manage your nodes which are integrated from the centralized location. Okay, so that is the intention of creating a cluster. Now to form this particular cluster um, and Docker Swarm doesn't need any additional tool actually. Okay, so the prerequisite is like you have to install Docker. That's it. Let's say I have five nodes on all the five nodes. I need to install Docker, uh, Docker Swarm. Okay, now I want to form a Docker Swarm cluster. Now what I need to do. So just take notes. Let's say this is one of the node. Okay, and rest of the nodes are here. Okay. For example, okay. Now, on all these nodes, you have to install Docker. Okay. So let's say you install Docker here. You install Docker here. Latest version, everything is fine. Here also, you have installed Docker. Okay. And here as well. And then here as well. Okay, now on all these uh, five nodes actually you have installed your docker now after this what is is there any other tool that I need to install no Okay, as simple as it is okay to form your uh, docker swam cluster It is pretty easy that no need of additional tools just you have to install docker Once a docker is installed you have to decide which node you want to make it as a master Okay so generally master or people may call it as control node or master node or manager node okay what are the technical term it is you can call it as controller now the technical term is controller or we call it as manager manager node or master okay so these are the three technical terms which will be given in the cluster okay either it can be called as controller or it can be called as manager or it can be called as master now you have to decide which node you want to make it so let's say i want to make this particular node as a controller now on this node you have to bootstrap so bootstrap in this sense always remember bootstrapping in this sense the first node which will be initialized okay the first node which will be initialized in the cluster is called as bootstrapping okay so it will do all the necessary things what is needed for your cluster or other nodes to join the cluster everything will be done on this particular node okay so that will be done by your docker swam cluster okay or the first node will do that okay so once you have done the bootstrap now this node will be acting as a controller or manager or a master okay from here you will be creating your you will be controlling all these nodes okay at this node as well as this node will be controlled by your components which are running on this particular node okay so your docker right so docker once it is converted into docker spam it will take care of it okay so that's how it will be done now once this is done from this particular node if you want to integrate these nodes to the master see now we need to integrate this particular slave nodes or we call we call it as compute okay we call it as compute or slaves or nodes some people will call it as just nodes okay now these nodes should be added into this particular cluster then only this particular node can deploy an application on this particular node right so how to do that there will be a certain command where you need to execute so that once a command is successfully executed just it will integrate to this particular node that's it nothing else okay so nothing more to be done just you have to execute that command okay it is also a docker command actually so that's how these nodes will get integrated to this particular nodes okay 
so once this is done your docker spam cluster is formed and then you can deploy your applications whatever you want okay so that's how it can be done okay now this is called as on hold it is called as docker spam cluster okay so this is how it looks now with this forming this particular docker spam cluster the problem is it doesn't provide so many functionalities it provides only a uh, few functionalities like you can manage like you can replica there is a replica concept okay and then we have secrets uh, then we have config map okay and then we have something like upgrade yes we have upgrade and rollback okay and then we have there is no load balancing we have to use external load balancer okay in there is no inbuilt load balancer actually so these are the functionalities major functionalities which are provided by your docker swamp cluster so let us talk one by one replica in the sense let's say you will try to deploy nginx okay uh, generally if you deploy only one particular nginx component what will happen you will be accessing that particular client uh, let's say a client will be accessing that particular application you will get some response that's fine if unfortunately that particular container is not responding to the request okay your container is running but the application which is inside the container may not respond to your request it could happen right sometimes it could happen maybe a load or some particular component is missing or some specific request is not getting uh, like what say uh, generated so this could happen in the application at any point of time so when it is not getting responded i need some other alternative container where it could respond to my request which means it like a backup okay so we need multiple containers in such a way that the the benefit is you can divert your traffic equally among all the containers what you have and all the containers should have the same data okay not only the application version should be same nginx 1.19.0 okay initially the replica will be only one which means that you will deploy only uh, technically this is called a service when you try to create an application on this particular docker spam it is called a service okay so when you try to create a service okay uh, saying that nginx with the replica is equal to one right now okay so what does it mean like now this only one container will be one service will be created for you for this particular nginx web application okay so if you try to increase it to uh, let's say three now what will happen so now the replica count has been increased okay so it will increase same container will be created three uh, three containers will be running in the background not about the data every container is individual okay we can we can uh, share the storage like using this volume mount or something among all these three containers can have the same data that can be done but all the three containers will have the same application version that is an intention actually so once that is done that that is what docker swam will do it for you okay so if one container is not available i can divert the traffic to the rest of the containers which i have okay so this is how that that is the intention of replica the same concept is also available on your uh, kubernetes orchestration tool as well okay so in the docker swam also we have it the benefit is instead of having uh, running your application as a standalone like using a single container you will be creating multiple containers in such a way that the traffic can be diverted among the containers okay so that is the intention of using this replica concept in order to have this common data among these containers you have to use some common volume like nfs or a volume mount or something like that okay docker itself cannot do it automatically okay the data replication will never happen until unless the tool has the feature of it okay but nginx doesn't have a feature to replicate the data among all the containers what it has you have to do it explicitly to have a common storage okay now that's okay the concept is to understand only the replica what it does exactly in docker swarm okay in any cluster if you hear something about replica concept it is the same functionality okay it will create multiple containers with the same application simple all the containers will follow the same template that's it okay 
now uh, secrets and config map is something if you want to inject some data into your container okay maybe sensitive data or non sensitive data if you want to inject that for that we can use secrets and config map config map is for plain text information secrets is for encrypted information okay these two concepts you will all be or this is already covered in kubernetes okay upgrade and uh, downgrade downgrade in the sense rollback okay so let's say you deployed some application it is version called let's say you deployed initially with nginx called 1.19.0 now your developers told that we don't want this 1.19.0 we don't want to run on this particular version please upgrade they will try to tell you that please upgrade the nginx version uh, whatever it is installed on your docker swarm cluster now what we can do we can use an upgrade concept where we can upgrade our nginx version from 1.19.0 to any latest or any other version okay this can be done so which means that at any point of time without disturbing your all the containers uh, at a time making your application down without doing that you can upgrade your application from one version to another version again at any point of time you can roll back okay roll back in the sense from latest we found that developers have found that there are too many bugs which is called there are so many vulnerabilities and bugs which are not getting fixed or may not be get fixed which is causing the application to get hacked or to get exposure to the vulnerabilities now developers what have they have told is nothing but once they got a confirmation they have told that they want to revert back to the old version okay so then what they want to do now you can roll back your application from one version to the another version whichever you want like from where you have came from okay so this is how it can be done so that is a concept of upgrade and roll back okay upgrade in the sense at any point of time you can upgrade from one version to higher version okay above version of it roll back in the sense coming from older version uh, new version to the older version backward okay maybe one step backward or two steps backward it depends upon our need okay external load balancer in the sense now when you heard the concept of replica you you are telling that there are three containers right i am telling that there are three containers which will serve the same uh, same application data or what a same application now how your client will contact to this particular containers can should he need to update his front end application with all the three containers ip address no right it cannot be right so that's the reason what we have to do we have to use some load balancer in front of this so that the traffic will get equally distributed among this containers that should happen right so what is the intention of using the load balancer to uh, divert the traffic equally among all the containers and there should be one point of contact one endpoint to reach to this particular containers that is the intention of using load balancer now this load balancer feature is not inbuilt to your docker swarm you have to use some external load balancer so that you will deploy somewhere let's say you have this aws load balancer or you have your own load balancer like ha proxy or nginx load balancer whatever you have you configured in one server okay now that server will be acting as a front end and the back end will be your docker nodes port number and the ip address okay so what you have to do you have to expose this particular containers using a port forwarding which means that a port on the node will be binded to your container that's how you have to do once it is done you have to configure the external load balancer it's up to you to install on the manager or any other separate node and then you can do a load balancing to your applications so clients will be accessing that particular url load balancer url so that will divert the traffic even the user cannot understand the client cannot understand if any one of the container is down because the down container the traffic will not get accepted in a load balancer the traffic will be sent only to the containers which are able to respond why because a load balancer will do an health check on that particular endpoints internally so that's the reason it will decide whether to send a traffic to that particular container or not okay so this is these are the main features which are present in your docker spam these are the only few features which you see about this particular docker spam actually you forget about this load balancer even this load balancer you have to configure externally 
it is not an inbuilt feature of your load balancer okay now if you try to compare with this kubernetes orchestration tool how it makes a difference for me okay so let's try to understand that okay so if you look at this particular docker spam and kubernetes differentiation generally this was developed by google in 2014 and they made it as open source when i started i started in 2016 actually maybe the third version or fourth version i guess i would if i don't remember actually like it's a third version or fourth version where i started this kubernetes understanding the concept of this kubernetes and why it should be used okay that's where i heard and i practiced it 2016 so and this was released in actually 2014 okay so docker spam was there from long back when the docker was implemented when the they want to form a kubernetes cluster sorry docker cluster they have implemented this docker spam it is developed by docker spam community okay and this is developed by google uh, in for inter their internal purpose and later on in 2014 they made it as open source and the people now started contributing to this okay open source uh, community and this was owned by now cncf okay so cncf is nothing but cloud native computing foundation okay so what is that is nothing but let me show you so cloud native uh, compute foundation in the sense this is an open source community which will like there will be many number of developers contributors and everything they will decide which tool should be used for the your kubernetes implementation or any other implementation okay they will decide okay for uh, you can see including kubernetes incubators there will be contributors members end users there will be so many other things okay always what i recommend is nothing but for you guys make a habit like go to the blogs read the blog so you will understand what are the new implementations which are done in kubernetes okay so if you want to know that definitely you have to read this particular blog okay whether you may become a team lead or whether you become a advertise uh, like architect engineer or like a devops engineer you have to be up to date with the new tools and new implementation which was done in kubernetes okay so that's why i recommend to read this particular blogs okay for kubernetes we have a separate blog okay let me show you the blog that is cncf block which is the open source community and this is especially designed for kubernetes okay a new implementation which are done in 2021 so you can see the design a new design for volume populators so just read this okay it was released on august 30 okay which means that it is almost today right yeah it was done today okay so you, you can just read it so now the new release is 1.2 uh, 1.22 but we will be using 1.21 of a stable release okay so there will be so many things which will be implemented in your kubernetes okay always you have to read these two documents in order to be up to date what is that if you want immediate update just read this kubernetes block okay if you need some other things including kubernetes and all understanding some concepts like this see infrastructure as a code platform as a service everything you need to know like some other concepts which they will try to tell you like there's something interesting for you okay some monitoring tools or something like that that might suit your uh, kubernetes and open source open sourcing of your security audit everything like so many things actually okay if you want to see what are the certifications we have just go through this the main certifications are CKA, CKAD, and CKS. Okay, so these are the three certifications. I did only these two actually CKA and CKS. Okay, you know, to do this particular CKS, you have to either have a CKA or CKAD, any one of them. Okay, uh, then only you can write your CKS exam. Okay. So these are about the certifications and these are about the blocks which you have to read. Always I keep reading these particular blocks actually. Okay. So these are the blocks which you have to read about your understanding the Kubernetes new implementations. Okay. So let me ping this particular blocks so that you can be reading it. So even though the tools are there, some things might be changed the functionality of the tool also might change actually they might implement a new one to that particular existing uh, functionality 
they might add some minute changes and all so always you have to read it and understand okay though you know about something but still you have to read it again the documentation why because they might have changed the functionality right earlier it was working like some xyz flow now it can, it can be changed to one abc flow okay tool is same the function the component is same but the functionality might have changed okay so for that reason only you have to be up to date now coming to this particular differentiation more extensive and customizable means you can customize you can enable whatever you want and you can disable at any point of time whatever you want that can be done in kubernetes docker swarm it doesn't provide you more uh, features for you to enable and disable it is like less extensible extensive and then less customizable okay you cannot customize too much your docker swarm according to your organization need but whereas kubernetes since it is like bunch of components right so you can disable whichever you want and you can enable whichever you want at any point of time okay but the problem is kubernetes is having a heavy setup means like not only installing a doc container tool but also you have to install kubernetes components you have to open the firewall the port numbers you have to know which port numbers need to be opened okay you have to know which packages need to be installed how to bootstrap it so it's like a bit heavy setup when you try to compare with docker swarm docker swarm it's simple just you have to install docker once a docker is installed you have to decide which node and then you have to run a docker swarm command that's it then your docker swarm cluster is formed it's not like kubernetes okay you set up and you have to install some components and all it's not like that okay now uh, if you are only want some if you are only working with a docker and you are trying to deploy some applications then go for docker swarm okay but or else it is not at all needed um since it has so many tools and so many components internally running with that's the reason it will have high fault tolerance okay that's the reason where a docker swarm has no other components running except this particular docker docker uh, service uh, you have to always keep monitoring on this docker system ctl uh, status docker uh, nothing else whereas here we need to check the components other components as well so that's the reason it has low fault tolerance okay provide strong guarantee to the cluster state at the expense of speed a strong guarantee of the cluster in the sense once a cluster is formed right you will have all the functionalities all the components running as per your expectation okay and whereas docker swarm facilitates for quick continuous deployment and scale even in very large cluster we can use it for if you have large components that need to be installed on your cluster we can go for docker swarm but you have to compromise on the functionalities okay you don't get too many functionalities or too many features available on this particular docker swarm okay if you are compromised with that then you can go for docker swarm at any point of time okay enables load balancing uh, the contributors to this particular docker swarm is like too less okay compared to your kubernetes okay enables load balancing when the container pods are defined see technically in kubernetes containers are called as pod i'll tell you what is this pod and all but technically it is called as pod are defined as services so internally if you want a load balancer there is a uh, functionality called service that component you have to install okay then automatically it will have a load balancer but whereas here you need to use some external load balancer to use this feature okay so this is all about it now let's try to understand the kubernetes architecture okay so how it should be installed uh, what is called as master and which is called as minion okay minion is nothing but a um, slave okay so what are the components will be running on master i technically call it as controller okay which components should be running on the controller and which component should be running on the compute you can have one or more controllers for high availability and you can have uh, two two three or some n number of nodes or as a slave it depends upon the number of applications you are trying to deploy on that particular cluster okay based on that you can you can increase the number of nodes at any point of time we can add a node 
it's no need to worry we can remove the node from the cluster or we can add the node to the cluster at any point of time okay that's one thing we can remember now um, in kubernetes architecture you have controller and you have compute compute nodes on the controller what are the components we have to install apart from docker or any other containerization tool i'm not saying only docker should be used so keep the docker aside okay docker is a containerization tool where you can run your application in the container level to build the images to have the networking features you have so many other things but it doesn't mean that kubernetes should use only docker no see docker is the only it's not the only tool which we have in the market right now to run your containers we have so many other tools okay why kubernetes you might have heard that kubernetes is deprecating this docker support from 1.22 uh, did anyone heard about this no okay so the concept is simple the kubernetes is deprecating this particular docker support it's only a support okay they are trying to deprecate this particular docker support from kubernetes as a backend containerization tool kubernetes cannot create a containers it should these components have a different behavior but in order to create a container either you have to use a docker or we have to use any other tool in order to create a containers okay now kubernetes is dropping from docker support okay from 1.22 version actually what is the reason and all we will discuss i'll tell you what is the reason but first of all let us keep that particular topic aside okay now oh okay what what are the other tools that we can use we have container d we have creo cri hyphen o creo we have rt uh, rtx hyphen d so we have some other tools which are also present which can be used for your kubernetes actually okay docker a container d and creo these are the three major components which you might have heard among this which is the most used container runtime interface in the backend apart from docker is nothing but container d why because your docker is also using container d understood docker itself is not creating a container actually docker is using container d let me tell you first of all about this okay is that true my statement is true or not let me try to explain Look at look at this particular container creation in Docker. What will happen? Look at the first point. Docker CLI is used to execute a command. So you will use Docker CLI command in order to create a container. For example, you executed some command. Docker container um, run hyphen d. You gave some options and then at last you gave some image name. So once you execute that command, Docker CLI will uh, it will it will it will, it will open some particular API. It will create some particular api that api will send the request to your docker daemon right your docker server through the socket through socket it will uh, it will load the appropriate api uh, when you are trying to create a container a container creation will have a separate api right so it will it will open that particular api and that api request will reach to your docker daemon okay once it is reached what your docker daemon will do once the instruction has been reached to your docker daemon your docker daemon calls container d to start a container look at this particular point okay so this is important for you to understand docker daemon calls container d to start a new container so which means that your docker tool is not it itself is creating you a container I told you in the last session as well docker is not a tool which is designed to create a containers it is providing you some particular additional features apart from creating a container okay so docker is leveraging the concepts which is already existing the, it is trying to utilize those concepts which is already present in your linux operating system it is utilizing that and then additionally it is doing some more other things and it is providing you some more other functionalities to create a container one among them is nothing but it is using container d docker is using container d so docker daemon calls container d to start a new container how it will pass information to your container d there has to be some procedure right that is nothing but grpc call golang developed remote procedure call 
okay it is also kind of api actually okay crutch style of api okay so now it will use that particular protocol grpc protocol in order to pass information from your docker daemon to your container d now once information has been reached to the container d now the responsibility of container d is to create a container so what it will do it will create an oci bundle from the docker image so that's the reason right when you are executing that command it will see whether the image is already there or not if not it will download that image or it will create a networking for you or it will create a volume for you all the all things that are needed for you to create a container it will load uh, it will create that particular oci bundle okay so once the oci bundle has been created from the docker image then it will pass this information to your run c okay to create a container so docker d doc, container d is also not creating a container so container d tool has its own feature called run c runtime uh, container runtime actually which we call it as that container runtime will be used in order to create a container what it will have it will take that particular oci bundle which container d has created that oci bundle will be given to the run c and run c will use namespaces c group and union file system concepts i told you right there is a wrapper called lib container it will use it will use that particular wrapper in order to create a namespace for the container c group and union file system for the container and once a container has been created it will start the container and the run c will will be done uh, will exit because once a container is started it will exit and the process will be running in the background so that's how your container will be created actually okay if someone asks you an interview also like how the containers are created in docker you have to explain this particular flow cli to daemon daemon to container d using grpc call and from container d to run c and run c will use the concept of namespaces c groups and all in order to create a container for you so this is what you have to explain okay now try to understand this so so from this you understood that instead of using docker why we are using container d because if you want to if kubernetes wants to create a container it first should pass to the cli cli should pass to the daemon and daemon should pass to the information to the container d now kubernetes thought that why can't this kubernetes communicate the pass information to the container d directly as per it needs okay so that's the reason they have removed that concept called docker docker cli and daemon has been removed they are directly using container d in order to create a containers so when you use directly that particular container d the latency will be too less the creation will be much faster and the communication also will be much faster when you directly communicate to that particular component instead of cli cli to daemon daemon to this particular there will be some latency right okay so that's the reason why we use a shortcut in order to go the regular traffic routes why because it creates a lot of a delay in my work right so that's the reason we choose a shortcut to reach to that particular destination so similarly kubernetes is trying to use that particular container d in order to create a containers directly so that's the reason docker got deprecated from 1.22 officially for kubernetes okay it doesn't mean that docker will not be useful for you okay if you want to build the images docker is the only solution which we have right now to build the oci bundle okay images okay so do remember this point always if you want to do some ci cd operations to build the image from the docker file and push it to the docker hub or any other repository or this all these things will be done only by docker right now okay there is no other choice for you future we don't know but currently this is the current situation so which doesn't mean that if kubernetes has deprecated this particular docker support it doesn't mean that you should not use it okay maybe for this tool it is creating some latency so that's the reason they have deprecated it okay so that's all so that is intention let us come to the point so container tool is mandatory first you have to install on all the nodes whichever the nodes you want to use in this particular cluster master minion nodes everything on all the nodes you have to install docker or any other container tool once that is installed on the master node you have to bootstrap the node okay once you bootstrap bootstrap you know what is now and you have to pick one of the node to make it as a controller or master node okay so once this node is bootstrap what are the components you get 
these components you will get what are those api server etcd control manager and then cube scheduler okay so let us try to understand one by one what is api server the cube api server is a first component which will take the request and which will send the request back okay which means that even with you when you try to communicate to your kubernetes whether through kubectl command or through direct api call using curl command or if you are using a dashboard any tool you use any interface or any medium you use for the first component who will take the information is nothing but api server okay what the api server will do first it will verify whether this user is valid to uh, enter to this kubernetes cluster or not first it will check that which is called as authentication authentication will be done on your api server authentication and authorization authentication in this is verifying the username password or certificates or token based authentication so it will verify whether this user is valid to log into this particular cluster, cluster or not okay once it is verified then it will verify the authentication sorry authorization what is authorization see if you have logged into a cluster it doesn't mean that you can access everything you need to have some limitations right in aws also you cannot access everything right you have some limitations any tool when you try to log in it doesn't mean that you have full access you might have only few access read only access or you can access few components but all not all the components in that few components also you can create but you cannot delete you can update you can create you can modify but you cannot delete it so all these restrictions will be done in the authorization so it will verify whether that particular user is having what kind of access and all and that information once it is verified then it will go to the next component okay so this is the phase where it will do this authentication and authorization okay api server so once that is done what is the next component it actually depends on what kind of thing you are trying to do but let's say if you are trying to deploy some application first it will contact to etcd okay in etcd it is nothing but a key value pair store it is kind of a database which will try to store the metadata information okay so metadata information like your entire cluster related information how many nodes you have what is ip address what are the components are running okay where the components are running how many applications you are running where that particular application is running what is ip address of that particular application each and every information of your entire cluster will be stored from small information minute information to the large information everything like whatever you have will be stored in the etcd so your etcd is the main component to get the whole bunch of information of your cluster okay if someone wants some information they have to contact your etcd okay so always it is recommended to take a backup of your etcd at any point of time okay you have to take a regular backups okay so that is what i can say so etcd is a key value pair kind of data uh, database store where you can store this information center it doesn't have a data like mysql MariaDB doesn't have any engine okay it has only information which can be stored as a key value pair format like a non sql database okay so that's how it is so this etcd you have so many other tools which can be supported like we have console we have zookeeper and all but etcd is a recommended key value pair store for your kubernetes cluster by default also you get this one okay now <clears throat> so it has a whole bunch of information so my question is does etcd will gather this information or someone is helping this uh, to get the whole bunch of information of your cluster yes so etcd doesn't do this okay etcd is responsibility is only to store the information and retrieve the information if someone trying to authenticate like authentication once it is done authorization is also done kubernetes api will ask him that okay please give me this information so it will search for that and it will give the information to your api server okay so etcd is it getting the information on its own to get, uh, have the cluster information no who is helping him control manager so cube control manager will not only have this uh, it does this particular task where it will collect the information of your entire cluster with certain interval 
it will keep on check it your cluster status and everything and your application status as well if any any one of the application is not working as per the expectation it will try to fix that as well okay so that's how the control manager will do let's say i'm trying to say that my nginx should run with three replicas now it is running only with two replicas somehow one pod is deleted so automatically queue control manager will see the information decide what is your desired information and what is your current status it will compare it is anything is mismatching it will try to implement that with the desired state okay desired in the sense what you are expecting okay so that information will be available in etcd once it is created so with that it will try to compare and it will see whether the desired information is present uh, same as your expected current state if it is mismatching it will try to fix that let's say now it is running with only two replicas but my expectation is three in the etcd so additional one pod will be get created okay so that is a thing which will be done by your control manager there will be one more component it depends upon where you are trying to install that is nothing but cloud sorry one more component is cloud control manager cloud control manager in the sense if you are trying to install your kubernetes on eks like azure kubernetes cluster or if you are using azure azure kubernetes cluster or eks like aws kubernetes cluster or if you are using gks google cloud kubernetes cluster or ibm kubernetes cluster any kubernetes cluster on cloud side cloud has its own control manager called as cloud control manager okay you might hear about that as well okay its task is also same thing but it is specific to designly for cloud okay so we have discussed about edcd we have discussed about cloud control manager or cube control manager and then we have seen another component called cube scheduler what is this exactly what it does the responsibility of this particular component is to decide which compute node you have to use in order to launch the application or create a resource on that particular node that decision will be taken care by your cube scheduler so cube scheduler will take the decision on which node it should launch the application okay that is a one decision which will be taken. so it has some algorithm in order to see it will calculate it will see how much resources are already consumed on this particular node and it will see what is the left uh, uh so resources on this particular node based on that what is your request it will see and it will see whether this particular node is suitable for launching this application or not okay so that is the thing which will be taken care until unless nothing is specified by the user if you specified that it should launch only on this particular node cube scheduler will tell that okay it should launch on this particular node api server will go it will pass information to that particular node okay so the decision making of launching the resources on a specific compute node will be taken care by your cube scheduler okay you can also design your own cube scheduler actually uh customized scheduler but it is not our concept okay we are not doing that right now okay and it is always recommended in high availability to make your etcd as high available high available in the sense highly available in the sense not only running single etcd run multiple etcds which means that if one of the etcd is down still you have other two etcds to respond to your data okay because this is the main component right of your entire kubernetes cluster information so that's the reason okay and take regular backups the intention is if something goes wrong you can restore your cluster from the backup okay so that is intention so now uh, once this is done once a decision has been made and it is given to the api server you might have observed that none of the component is talking with each other you can see cube scheduler cannot talk to etcd control manager cannot talk to the etcd or etcd cannot talk to the control manager or scheduler or scheduler cannot talk to the control manager it has to talk contact with each other only through api server okay for everything it will do authentication authorization then only once that is done then only it will pass the information okay so that is a one more thing you have to remember at last and which is important okay none of the components will directly contact with each other they will come through only api server okay that's a major point which you have to remember
and once api server has made a decision it will go to the first component on the node is nothing but kubelet so kubelet is the first component who will receive the information from the api server okay once the information has been received it will do the necessary changes and means like modification according to your docker or any other containerization tool you are using it will pass the information to that particular component okay api server is directly not passing the information to your docker it is passing to the kubelet and kubelet will pass information to the uh, containerization tool whatever you are using maybe uh, container d or docker or any other containerization tool okay now once a kubelet has received that information and once it is passed to the docker docker will create a container you know how the container will be created that flow also i explained just now once that is done kubelet will send a response to your api server api server will display either in the dashboard or a cli or in the a, uh, call like api call okay and once that is also done that information will be stored in etcd okay now what about kube proxy kube proxy is a proxy server which will bypass information let's say when you are it's like it, it uh, when you are doing some port forwarding or when you are accessing your application when you want to access your application directly kube proxy will directly add an entry in the ip tables using the ip tables it will by uh, it will transfer the information from your node to the application which is running on that particular node okay if you see in docker also we have docker proxy okay the docker proxy will does the same thing when you do a port forwarding uh, check your uh, docker status you will see if some docker proxy which is running in the background the docker proxy is nothing but whenever you do a port forwarding the proxy will come into picture okay, to bypass the information so similarly when you are doing some port forwarding on this particular node that particular port when you try to access on that particular node it will transfer the information to the actual application which is running in the background that will be taken care by your kube proxy okay so these are the components which we have and this is the responsibility of each and every component okay same components will be running sometimes uh, though the diagram is telling like this even kubelet and kube proxy will be running on the master node as well okay so don't uh, say that master doesn't have a kubelet and kube proxy kubelet and kube proxy will be running on the master node as well why because on the master node also some ports will be running actually ports are nothing but containers will be running on the master node as well to run that you need to have kubelet and kube proxy as well okay so though the diagram is especially saying this but kubelet on kube proxy also will be running on the master node i will show you that anyways okay so this is all about your kubernetes architecture any questions on this in understanding the components or any other questions okay uh, so this, can we oh. have uh, multiple uh, master sorry can we have multiple master node yeah of course see you can have multiple master nodes that's what i'm saying you can have three master nodes and you when you execute kubectl command you need to have a load balancer for that that load balancer will decide on which node it should communicate now this it is what is a how we can replicate the data of your master among all the three nodes that will be taken care by your etcd so the three ETD, etcds will be running on three different nodes okay all the nodes if you try to communicate you will get the same information of your cluster that is happening because your etcd is a main component in high availability okay so you will n number of master nodes you will run that n number of master nodes will have the same etcd running which will distribute the data among all the three nodes okay so that's how the data will get replicated on all three nodes the high availability will happen which means that if any one of the master node is down still my kubelets kubectl commands go to the load balancer from the load balancer it will contact to the controller node which is up and running that's it okay so this is how the components are running so in order to form this kubernetes cluster we have so many tools among them we will be using uh, just a second yeah we have so many tools to form your uh, kubernetes cluster actually like we have kube adm let me note it down kube adm we have kube spray okay and then we have uh, uh, 
we have this kind okay and then we have um, micro creators okay and then we have uh, other components like we have kind cube spray cube adm micro creators we have podman okay then we have so many other tools actually okay among this which tool is suitable for us in production and in our thing is nothing but cube adm okay so we will be using cube adm tool in order to form our kubernetes cluster whether it is on cloud or if you are creating instances on the cloud or on on-premises kubernetes cluster you will be using this cube adm tool okay in if you are using aks or gks and eks no need of using this particular tools automatically cloud will do it for you okay it will form the control plane node and you will not have access to this particular control you will not manage this this will be managed by your cloud aws or google cloud or azure cloud they will manage this particular node you have when you are trying to execute kubectl command it will go to this and it will create applications on this particular node when you execute kubectl command you will see only the slave nodes you cannot see the master node because it is controlled by your cloud providers okay so you will not get an opportunity to see what are the components running what how it is running and all okay so that's one thing you have to remember now whereas this if you are running kubeadm on your local cluster on your virtual box right so you will be creating your two nodes master node and worker node so you will understand what are the components are running how they are running and everything you will be managing from this particular node setter so that's the reason we will be starting with this we will try to understand that okay so in this before we begin you have to understand this particular prerequisites okay for a node what should be there okay so compatible linux host you already know like we will be using ubuntu that is fine and 2 gb ram at least every node should have 2 gb of minimum ram and two core cpus i have totally eight core cpu and i have 20 gb of ram which is more than enough for me to run two node cluster or three node cluster whatever it is okay full network connectivity which means that every node should communicate with each other and it should communicate to the internet as well so that is called as full network connectivity between all machines in the cluster okay unique host name already every node will have a unique name host name mac address and everything that's fine certain ports to be opened on your machine so here we need to open few port numbers like this these port numbers should be opened on the controller node and this port should be opened on the uh, like slayer nodes or uh, like compute nodes so if you are not using any firewall no need to worry but if you are using a firewall you need to open this port numbers as well okay after this swap memory should be disabled this is important if swap memory is enabled you cannot form a kubernetes cluster okay so remember this point if you have a swap memory enabled you cannot form your kubernetes cluster anyway you will come to know if you try to execute the command also if by enabling this swap memory it will reject okay you can see that these things you already know uh, like these are the commands which you have to execute in order to allow the bridge traffic because you are using bridge network and all in, in order to communicate from one node to another node the components which are running you have to enable this particular bridge you have to enable this particular module and you have to enable this particular network settings as well okay so you have to do this once this is done then we can go and we can you, you need to install the runtime as i already told you kubernetes is not creating a containers you have to in, deploy some particular containerization tool you have to decide whether you want to use docker or whether you want to use container d or whether you want to use creo cri hyphen o okay so based on that you have to decide once this is done then you have to install your kubernetes components okay their packages repository and all you have to install. then we can bootstrap our first node okay then you have to follow these particular steps okay for initially the person might get confused so that's the reason let me explain one by one tomorrow how to form from your side what you have to do you have to create two nodes with ubuntu 20.04 version and bridge network and it should it should have two core cpu with at least 4 gb of ram okay if you don't have enough space on this go to gcp account 
create two instances with the same specifications what I have told. Okay. Once that is done, anyway, we will see tomorrow what you have to verify on the node. Then I will tell you, then you can practice. Once the Kubernetes cluster is done tomorrow, then we will start with our actual components. Okay. How to deploy applications and all. Okay. Uh, any questions or uh, shall we wind up for the today? Already have the Kubernetes cluster actually. For previous batch, I used to use this particular two nodes. One is controller node, compute node. You can see here. These nodes are having, uh, for controller, I gave 4 GB of RAM and it has having two core CPU. I have totally eight CPUs. Okay. And it is having network called bridge network. Okay. Nothing is enabled, only bridge network to have internet connection as well as internal communication as well okay so this is what i have done for both the nodes i have disabled the swap memory once i logged in okay, okay. so these are the things which you have to take care create these two instances uh, two, no, two nodes or two instances from tomorrow we can see how to install kubernetes cluster okay thank you keep this document with you Okay, anyway, this document is already there, but let me give this. So keep it with you. Try to read this and understand. Okay. As the important points which I have told, always try to be habituated to reading the blocks of your Kubernetes and CNCF. Okay. So that you will be up to date or else you will be lacking in understanding the new features and new functionalities. Okay. Yeah. See, today I might have told some functionality. Tomorrow it might change due to some bugs or something like that or they might have added new functionality to the existing component. They can do it anytime that it can change because you can believe you cannot believe this for every three months there is a new release. Imagine how fast it is getting changed. Okay, the functionalities are getting added or changed whatever it is. It is happening. So that's how this component is getting uh, like contributed. Okay. So you have to be up to date. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you for the day.